there are many reasons people come to psychedelic medicine. And a lot of times it's not because they want to heal. I did not think healing was part of what I was looking for, but almost immediately I realized, wow, I need some, I need some healing. I think once that realization happens, then it becomes, you can turn outward. So uh, whether you approach it for medicinal uses, religious uses, um, trauma uses, lots of different ways to get into the medicine, and then very similar ways to, uh, to expand, which is share with others. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Psychedelic Conversations podcast. I have with me Matt Zeman, and I can't wait to dive into this conversation. Hope you guys enjoy it, and let's welcome Matt. So great to have you. Susan, I'm glad to be here. I'm excited about the work you do in the, this podcast and, and therapy and all of that. So looking forward to diving diving deep with you. Likewise, likewise. I know you're doing some great stuff as well. So I just want to give our listeners a bit of a context to just to know you a little bit more and what you do. Um, so you are the CEO and the co-founder of Happy with double Y, which is interesting, a mental wellness company that specializes in psychedelic assisted ketamine therapy, along with digital therapeutics that promote life transforming outcomes. And you're also an author. So your book has been quite uh you know it's it's kind of like taking the psychedelic space with uh what they call it they say uh, with storm or you know it's really <laughs> by storm by storm right so um which i'd like to dive in and what you have been writing and sharing and what are the uh, things that our listeners could kind of uh, learn uh, from so yeah looking forward to dive in but as always you know we always begin these conversations with your background story and also what brings you to this work, if that's okay with you. Oh my goodness, happy to share. Um, for me, it was a, a guided psilocybin or magic mushroom experience that um, I really went in underprepared. So even though I had a guide um, and uh, it was in a group setting, um, I didn't really have my, I didn't have any expectations. I was, I was doing it more as an experience versus seeking, which I've later learned is a, a much more interested in the seeking side than the experience side. And um, in this one, in this first experience, um, I just had wave over wave of emotion. I had um, this feeling of being completely loved and completely safe and realizing, oh my gosh, I didn't realize I didn't feel loved and safe until now I felt it. And that was a, uh, it's a real eye opener, and I had a I had a death experience, which was um, was really profound. And probably for me, most importantly, I reconnected with my mom, who died when she was forty nine, and um, and I could connect with her, pull her through to me, and then all the way through to my kids. And um, I just my mind was just so completely blown open by this experience. I was like, I need to learn more. That led me to a here part of the world where I ended up doing a master's in psychology and neuroscience at King's College, and then um, really doing a deep dive into all things psychedelic, both on the academic side and personally. I've gone ahead and experienced a number of different psychedelic medicines, studied under a number of different teachers, and uh, yeah, and continuing to heal myself, learn more, and uh, and spread the word. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Of course. Yeah. What are your thoughts on people coming into this space because of their own trauma or because of their own healing? Um, some of my friends and we have a, a laugh, you know, the inside joke, like um, psychedelics are recruiting us. They have an agenda. W what are your thoughts? You know, I know it's it sounds hilarious, but um, it's um, it's it's hard to ignore to acknowledge so many people coming into this space with their own story first. And really diving into their own healing or their own transformational process and then wanting to bring it to people. There are a lot of layers in your question there, Susan. That was really uh, well put. So I think you alluded to 
is it possible that these psychedelic medicines are actually have some type of intelligence and are recruiting us and and uh and helping raise consciousness and and for a number of reasons and i think that's fascinating and something that five years ago i would have said like you're out of your mind and now i'm like yeah i do think so i think that's absolutely part of what's happening here um and then you asked about are people coming in because they want to heal themselves first and then once they realize this healing power they want to share it i think that's absolutely true i think that's what we're doing all the time it's it's we we are we are healing ourselves and then through our healing we're able to turn outward and help others um i think if you come in this not sorry let me try again actually i'm going to i'm going to restate this <clears throat> There are many reasons people come to psychedelic medicine, <clears throat> and a lot of times it's not because they want to heal. I did not, I did not think healing was part of what I was looking for, um, but almost immediately I realized, wow, I need some, I need some healing. Um, I think once that realization happens, then it becomes you can turn outward. So uh, whether you approach it for medicinal uses, religious uses, um, trauma uses. Um, lots of different ways to get into the medicine and then uh, very similar ways to, uh, to expand, which is share with others. Yeah. There is a innate, um, wiring, innate need or innate desire to share. That's what makes us human, right? That that's the, the essence of what we are as humans. We always want to share what we find value in and what really helps to, to I mean, deep down, I know there's a lot of negativity and a lot of um stuff that's happening in the psychedelic space uh which is expected um you know when something really becomes so popular on the you know social media and uh you know the mainstream media i i i, I get it you know it's it's very common to also have these other you know conflicting ideas and all that stuff but Ultimately, as human beings, I think we have this desire to really do good, be good and do well. And that plays out a lot in the um, authentic psychedelic use, I think. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think we all are born into this abundant world. And then we are trained and programmed that to be scared, there's not enough to be afraid that this needs to be mine, my land, my money, my, my things, my stuff. And holding on to all of that is this there's a scarcity mindset with um and then through that we again forget to that we are enough right now as we are um and i think with psychedelic mushrooms it's such a wake up call it's such a it's such a blanket of love that uh wraps around us that it's like okay so maybe i maybe i was wrong or maybe my parents were wrong maybe my teachers were wrong maybe my government was wrong maybe there are there is there's something else to this um, and then I, th I think like any, anything else, so you have the, the personal transformation and then you have kind of the industry or how do you, and the, the other people, the other humans. And I think the same thing is true. I think there's, everybody's on their journey. There's some people who are more scared than others and, um, and it's okay. It's all good. Um, there's plenty for everybody and there'll be disagreements, but, uh, there's enough. We're enough. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful to state it that way. And now I just wanted to touch on your book, um, Psychedelics for Everyone. That's the title. Um, do you get any kind of criticism? Do you get like, why do you, you know, why do you promote this? It's not for everyone because there is obviously um, a lot more deeper talks around the harm reduction concept that we shouldn't promote it that way. Um how did you come up with the title and what are you really sharing in your book? Yeah. I mean, it's certainly, it's, it's, a, it's a, that's a, that's a good question. And I didn't, I don't mean that everyone should take a psychedelic, but I do believe that psychedelics truly are for everyone. And what I try to do in this book is share personal stories, then go through an overview of kind of psychedelic medicine as a whole, and then go into eight of the different more common psychedelic medicines kind of what are they what does the research say what is the experience like and the idea the overarching idea is that people should can read this book and say wow this is i now feel this way about taking a psychedelic myself 
I now feel this way about someone I know or love taking a psychedelic. And this may or may impact how I vote as we start entering into these, this world where it's going to become more, more of a, a legislative, uh, legislative options. Um, we saw here in the States, uh, Colorado, one of our states, just passed Proposition 122, where they're going to decriminalize five psychedelic medicines and create a statewide framework. That's the second state behind Oregon. So two out of 50, we're starting. It's starting. We have six different states with kind of uh, other, other different initiatives, multiple cities with different initiatives. So it's, I think it's important that everyone understand a little bit more about psychedelics. And let me just say one more thing about our in our country. Um, the Controlled Substances Act of 1970, which really went into kind of effect 71, everybody born 1971 or later, we've lived our entire lives in a prohibition. All we've been told is that drugs are bad. These psychedelic drugs are bad. They're going to fry our brain. They're going to get us addicted. There is no medicinal use. And we, can, we now have learned it's just not true. It wasn't true then, and it's not true now, but it's a lot of programming to unwire. So part of why Psychedelics for Everyone is I want this question asked. I want people to confront me because I want to be able to have this discussion on this topic. Does that make sense, Susan? Yeah, that's wonderful. And before we go into what do you share in your book briefly, obviously we don't want to give it away too much um, so our listeners can maybe read it for themselves and find out just wanted to say one more thing on that. Um, I speak to um, legendary people like James Fadiman and, you know, older generation from the, the revolution times. And, mm -hmm. you know, I never forget, he said in our conversation, like, we are your elders, like we are your elders. And he really appreciates the younger generation really leading and paving the way in the education. And I like the fact that he never uh, walked away from his, scientific approach and he always was a scientist and a researcher and um it was really profound to know that um us those who were born in the 70s like you said after all of the drugs were kind of gone underground and shut down it's very interesting because i have this idea that interestingly you know i talked to a lot of people to simplify it I have the most amazing conversations with the older generations who were coming from the 50s because they have a long history and affiliation. Like even Dr. Dr. Van, uh, Van der Kolk, you know, Dr. Basil Van der Kolk, he says, I'm the 50s kid, you know, I, all, I had my own share of, of the experience. So they are really a delight to have these conversations. And then you speak to the younger generation it's always about trauma and rebellion and we should, you know, make it all illegal. It was all about protesting and freedom fighting, right? It just kind of shows how deeply ingrained in our archetypal energy, the collective energy that it's archetypally like we've had enough and we've been suppressed. We want to just, you know, liberate everybody. So I see the difference. And then the elder, older generation is like, yeah, it's fine. It will happen. It's coming back. It's exciting. And they don't have the same agenda. I don't know if that makes sense. So I see, I see that the, the, you know, the, the later generation really playing out and acting out their own uh, suppressed um, uh, affiliation or relationship with psychedelic drugs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, can, I just can't imagine what that would have been like if you and think about the thousand papers on LSD with alcoholism or, or people who mm -hmm. are deep into the research. Um, all the all the therapists using MDMA with couples therapy or or even PTSD back then um, or trauma back then, and then to be told you have to stop, you know you have technology that works, and you have to stop. I just can't imagine how disheartening that that was for them. Um, I love when you're talking about uh, James Fadiman. I mean, he is so eloquent, and as he talks about things like. Um, why does, why does he pay so much attention to citizen scientists? He's like, it's so hard to do research on psychedelics. And the media incentivized is incentivized in a certain way. The academics are incentivized. The drug policy is incentivized. He's like, you, they've had to pick this very narrow band to do research on. But that doesn't mean that 
there are people who have bipolar uh, disorders using psychedelics. It doesn't mean there's not a place for an autistic uh, psychedelic community. And that he and that he points to data that exists, but is not in the traditional sense. And I love that he has been able to hold on to that, that I can do my own research. I can do this type of research and I understand it and I can talk about it. And there needs to be a place for citizen scientists in this community just because of how the last 50 years have, uh, have unfolded. Um, one of the people that you haven't had on yet is Dr. Carlos Warder, who I've really enjoyed studying under him. This guy's 75, MD, PhD, 18 books, and uh, working with psychedelic medicine for 50 years, starting in uh, his home country of Chile. Mm. And it's just, um, they have so much to offer those that lived through that and tried um, all the different things that they were trying before that uh, control, Controlled Substances Act. It's uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's my, amazing. Mind so blowing. Much to teach. Yeah, mind blowing. I think we really need to hold on to these um, wisdoms that they offer. Dr. Stan Grof would be another one. Uh, absolutely. Mm. And so, he made such an interesting shift into the breathwork world um, with holotro holotropic breathwork. But, um, but again, thousands of psychedelic sessions before he was told to stop. And from his uh, from what Czech Republic into a uh, into the states, his work in Maryland just. Yeah, incredible. I can't imagine what that was like to uh yeah to be told that. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's you know, having this is incredible right now. I mean, we can still draw so much out of their wisdom and what they offer. And going forward now, how do we so I just want to quickly, you know, close this uh thread and just move on to your book again, your book content. But um so I feel like um, I always thought the psychedelics were revealing, you know, mind revealing, unconscious mm -hmm. revealing experiences. That's why I feel like the younger generation, to me, when I observe them, it seems like they're acting out their own, like you said, the trauma, the scarcity, the suppression, the, you know, growing up in such a controlled environment. I think... Um, you know, they, they say there's, there's numbers for genera generation X and generation that there, there is, it's interesting. I see uh, the kids from the 70s are really leveraging the, the psychedelic um, uh, freedom and, uh, you know, decriminalization and all. If you look at some of the guys in front lines, except with Dublin, I'm, I know he's just single-handedly paving the way, but a lot of us are coming into it. Like we have a kind of a broader vision. And I like that because growing up, maybe things were not so available. It kind of helps us be more grateful and also not take it for granted and also be careful. And I always talk about harm reduction. I'm like, I know why, because I don't want this thing to end up like before again, so that we can all put our weights in and, and do our own part. Okay, so you've again yeah. brought a lot of depth into a single question. So I, I'm going to maybe for your listeners, back us up for just a moment and talk about almost the ideological difference between a Western medical model and a decriminalization model. <clears throat> and that these two sides sometimes don't get along at all. So in the Western medical model, these, these are people, Rick Doblin would be certainly in this camp who said, who said, you know, the most practical way to get these psychedelics back into the mainstream is to play the game. So how are we going to play the game? We're going to pick a pick a substance, in this case MDMA, and uh, and we are going to do a ton of research around a group that nobody can argue needs support, veterans and uh, victims of sexual assault, and we're going to get this approved, and we're going to live with the we're going to argue as best we can, but we're going to at least get a medical model out there. So that's kind of path number one. The decriminalization model is no, absolutely not. These are plants. Plants should be legal. Plants should be free. We do not compromise. And, um, and we need to decriminalize nature now. And both have ideological positions um, and very strong ones. Colorado won 53% of the vote for this Proposition 122, um, a Western model. Some decriminalization, five, five psychedelics decriminalized, but mostly a Western model. And the people who are detractors were saying this shouldn't be about corporate profit. The pros are like, yeah, let's let's get this out there. We can worry about corporate profit next. Um, so I don't I don't know. It's interesting to see how these two camps um clash sometimes. 
and it's uh I'm not sure it's an older younger thing or if it's a, if it's just a difference of uh, of opinion. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Uh yeah, this is so interesting. I listened to one of Rick's conversations this, uh, recently and I liked um I think the podcast that was saying so you know we really appreciate your your science your approach in the scientific way and he's like no 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 we're not doing science we're doing political science it was really good it's really good yeah it's um, a great line and totally totally makes sense mm-hmm. uh like you said the idea is to get out there and then we're going to figure out how to handle the whole you know harm reduction and education pieces Great stuff. Um, so in your book, can you tell our listeners um, what are you covering and uh, and what really what you're passionate about and what did you bring to us in that book? So what the, the book, the goal of the book is that someone with a non-medical background or non-science background can read it and understand it. Mm-hmm. But I've also included references. So if anyone's like, wow, that's really interesting. I want to see what that study's about. You can go and find it. So you have a choice. And then we had... Um, we had uh, all of the chapters uh, medically reviewed for accuracy. So the, the, again, all of that is just about trust. How do I keep in many, many ways earning the trust of the reader? Even the five, I tell five very personal stories in the beginning to, to kind of, this is who I am. And the idea is, can you trust me? I'm trying to cut, this is why I'm coming at this, trust me. Um, and then, and I want to actually even take, trust me is such a careful, I want to be careful on that. It's, I'm trust that I'm trying to do the right thing and now read this and then come to your own opinion. Um, so yes, I think if, if someone's just starting out into this world of psychedelics and they're curious, there's a lot of beginner's information, kind of what are the, where, where do psychedelics come from? What are they? How have they been used? What's their role in history? What's their role in religion? Uh, what's their role in science? That's all there. If you're specifically curious about any particular medicine or at least eight, it goes into a pretty deep dive. This is how this particular medicine is used for depression or anxiety or OCD or eating disorders with, with references. Um, and then it gets, if you're, if you're an experienced psychonaut, um, there's, there's stuff in there for you as well, that you'll get the multiple layers of conversation, or there's a religious primer for, uh, in there about what's kind of what's happening. Peyote is an example. And, um, and, and why are we steering people more towards mescaline versus peyote? And, um, similar thing with the synthetic bufo with 5-MeO DMT versus going and grabbing it from the uh, Sonoran frog. So there's a there's a little bit of there's there's stuff in there for everybody, and you can read it linearly, or you can read kind of the the first stories, the opening, and then jump around to the medicines that are calling to you. Yeah, that's fun. And a whole section on microdosing, by the way, forgot about that. That includes mm-hmm. Fatty Men's protocol as well as Paul Stamets stack. Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. That's great. I think this is exactly what we need right now in terms of education. It's always been my passion. I think one of the biggest struggles we have now is to how to educate or bring the education to people so that it's, it's so that they can go, go out in the world and make their own conclusions and make the right choices. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of the point of the medicine. I mean, all of the psychedelic medicine is saying you individual have an innate ability, an individual ability to heal. You can do this yourself, but you need, you don't need, but this technology might be able to help you do it. And by quieting down your default mode network, helping some neurons fire that don't normally fire, you might, and, and removing uh, shame, blame, and guilt from your feelings, you can look at things differently and in many cases heal or connect or find more creativity and then move forward. And it's a, uh, it's not what we've grown up with, where you're going to be prescribed a pill and take it every day and have to do talk therapy for years and years and years. This, in many cases, is a, a once or twice in a lifetime experience. And for others, it's more, but that's, and for others, it's more by choice. They want to keep diving deeper. They don't need to, but they want to. And that's beautiful. Yeah, just giving the choice to people. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you so much for that. So what, what brings you to ketamine? Why work with ketamine? And if you could uh, please tell us about the, the substance as well, what it is. And, and I know you said you kind of work in the mental health approach. So it would be so lovely to understand ketamine a bit more from the person who's really 
into this work. So I, I was super ignorant about psychedelic medicine when I started. Um, I knew, knew about magic mushrooms, I knew about LSD, I knew about ayahuasca, but I really didn't know much else. And um, when I first heard, wait, a, that there's a legal psychedelic that anyone in America can get a prescription for, I just couldn't believe it. I just, I didn't know. And then my, my first question was like, well, why aren't they getting prescriptions for this? And it led to things like, well, it's a generic medication. Pharma doesn't make any money off of generics. You don't take it very often. Uh, for most people who take ketamine, you take it kind of six times over six weeks. And then based on how it affects you, maybe you do it once every six weeks or every four weeks or every two weeks, but it's, it becomes spread out. Some people don't take it again after those initial six sessions. Um, it works on your glutamate system, unlike other uh, psychedelics and medicines, which focus more on the serotonin side. Um, and you can take it three, uh, four different ways, primarily a bunch of different ways. You can take it through intravenous uh, injection uh, or sorry, intravenous uh, int IV intramuscularly. Uh, you can take it nasally. We have a, uh, an FDA approved thing called Spravato. Uh, which you can take in a clinic nasally. And then you can take it orally or sublingually where you stick it under your tongue for uh, 12 to 15 minutes, depending on what your doctor tells you. You spit it out or swallow again, depending on what your doctor tells you and uh, have about a one hour experience. What is amazing about the oral ketamine and full disclosure, Happy is a, is a male, is a telemedicine company. So obviously I have a, have a bias here, um, but that you can do it from the comfort of your home. And that, is convenient um, and it also radically reduces the cost. In America, a six session ketamine protocol is typically around $4,500 to $6,000. A six session oral ketamine protocol is closer to $1,200. So it's a, a big, big difference. And uh, two big studies have come out. There's one with over 1,200 um, participants and 89% 89, I just want to be clear on that number, showed improvements in depression or anxiety. 63% was 50% or more. So it's it works. It works at home. Um, and it's powerful. Um, before we do one, I'm just going to dive on one more topic here, just as we're on ketamine. So you're hearing us talking about ketamine. You're hearing all the, the great uses, depression, anxiety, also substance use, all sorts of good things. This is under a medical model um, is what I'm talking about. So in a recreational model, ketamine has shown to be addictive. Um, in a recreational model, ketamine has shown to have, can have bladder issues and some other long-term effects. So the fact that you're hearing this on this podcast, if you're at a party and someone offers you ketamine, I'm still suggesting that you, you say no to that. One, because you probably don't know where that ketamine's come from. And two, because uh, there's just a lot of challenges on a recreational model that don't exist in a medical model. Thanks for covering that. This is really important. So how do you deal with the, um, is there a backlash when you entered, in, entered into this kind of business model? Um, everyone I speak to, they, they really, um, there's a huge stigma and negativity around ketamine being addictive. And um, yeah, it's something people don't really appreciate that much. But now we have all these studies and um, I also heard from really tr trusted medical models um, that's been kind of uh, being brought to us, you know, used by many different organizations that are credible. They're saying it works really well with anxiety, especially. And what could you say to us about how does it work directly with anxiety and why is it so efficient? Because so many people, especially the younger ones now, because we work with a lot of young people, Anxiety has been like the number one challenge right now, especially post-pandemic. So how do we explain uh, the safety, the best practices, and you know, how to go about? So you started with what are the backlashes on the telehealth? One of the things I think I'm surprised just as an entrepreneur that I didn't expect in the, um, in the psychedelic space is just how much, for lack of a better word, infighting there is between different camps. So the example here I'll give is the anesthesiologist camp historically has had a lot of training in ketamine. And there's a number of them that say, 
oh no, you should, nobody should be dealing with ketamine besides for us. We are the specialists. This is ours. And there's a number of ketamine clinics that you can go into and have a nurse anesthesiologist hook you up. And they're, and they're subscribing to what I call biochemical model of ketamine therapy. So let the medicine do its thing. We don't need to prepare you. We don't need to integrate. Just let the medicine work. So that's a, that's a philosophy. It's, it's a philosophy that, that has a medical degree behind it. And then you have psychiatrists who say, well, okay, well, you still need to be a doctor, but you need to be a mental health doctor. And we are, should be the only ones who are working with, with ketamine um, because we have both. We have the, the, the MD and we have the mental health background. And they've put their camp flags in the ground and many of them run beautiful practices, but it's typically expensive um, because their they're, the MD time is expensive. Then you have some psychologists and some uh, therapists who are saying, well, we really can bridge the gap. We need somebody to prescribe the medicine, but we can do this licensed therapy model because you need the therapy. And that's beautiful. I get that. But then you have guides and people have been working with psychedelic medicine for a long time. And they're saying, well, wait, whoa, whoa, all of you, hang on. We're talking about psychedelics. This is inner power of healing. This is about making a connection, making a safe container and allowing people to do their own work. I don't think you need to, uh, they're, they're saying, we don't think you need to be a licensed therapist for that. And that makes a lot of sense. So, um, there, there is backlash depending on which camp you talk to about whether telehealth is a, is a legitimate way to do this. Um, and I, I, yeah, I think I, we let the listeners make up their, uh, their own minds on, uh, on what they think from that. And then I, it seems I, I'm going to stop here for a minute before I go into how ketamine works, if that's okay with you. Did you have, yeah. did you have another question or something? No, keep going. Keep going. All right. So let's talk about how does ketamine therapy work to improve symptoms of uh, mental health disorders? So biologically, it changes the glutamate activity increases um, and increases what's called BDNF in the brain, which also improves neuroplasticity and synaptic strength. So this is kind of how strong your neurons are. Um, it then also um, like the other classic psychedelics, it suppresses what's called the default mode network. And then that, that is what provides that, um, that relief from worry and the other symptoms related to anxiety. So sometimes when someone takes ketamine, it's like, oh, the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders, which again brings that immediate reaction of, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how much I was carrying until it was lifted. So that's kind of that, that default mode network quieting down. Then we get into kind of the disassociative side effects of ketamine, which is, um, again, similar to um, other psychedelics. This is where you're able to unlock your subconscious thoughts and your repressed memories and emotions. Um, it helps patients open up to psychotherapy to explore kind of the underlying causes of these symptoms. But these are, these are where there can be visuals, there can be... Um, you, you, you separate from your body, you're looking at different things without that shame, blame, and guilt I was talking about. All of that is in that number three step. And then finally, for many patients, there's a spiritual effect um, where the medicine, for, for whatever reason, no one really knows why, helps them connect to the greater meaning of life um, around them. And this New connection can offer peace and relief from uh, depressive symptoms or feelings of hopelessness, makes them feel less alone, makes them feel like they're part of something bigger. Um, yeah, and that, that love and safety that I talked about earlier on all comes with that, that fourth step. So it's um, really a powerful medicine, and all of this can happen in these one-hour ketamine experiences. It's uh, yeah, super powerful. And, and very different than, I mean, for, again, listeners who are not familiar, a psilocybin experience or mushroom experience could be six to eight hours, ayahuasca is in that zone. So it's, it's very different to be able to do something in about an hour, um, have all these insights and connections. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, there is a saying, the right medicine or the substance for the right person in the right time could bring so much transformational uh, processes. So... I always look at it, people are drawn to different psychedelic substances. So I'm guessing there is a lot of people out there that could be interested in ketamine. 
um, you know, I've never really inter uh, was interested and never really studied that much ketamine. And now it's coming up a lot. It's literally um, difficult to ignore all the positive, you know, studies and the research has been done. Uh, what would you say if, if for our listeners, if there was anything we could be careful of, or is there anything they should be concerned about, or who, maybe the um, right way to ask is who shouldn't have or who should have ketamine, for example? Oh, that's a tough question because you get it. So I'll give it, I'll give it, I'll give one of the toughest answers to that is substance use, people with substance use disorders. So there, there are philosophies that if you've had a substance use disorder, you are more prone to addictive behaviors. Ketamine of all, is the only psychedelic that in animal tests, um, there's, there's a, there's a p potential for addiction. They hit the button. Um, that I doesn't happen is, on mushrooms. Yeah, this is a really good one, actually. So thank you for saying that. We need to be as transparent as possible as we can. And yeah, this is a big one, actually. Yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, so it's, it's a big deal. It doesn't happen. They're, the animals are not hitting the button when it comes to mushrooms or MDMA or LSD or Ibogaine or ayahuasca, but they do hit the button. They hit the, the button on, a, on ketamine sometimes. And so in a recreational setting, yeah, people can get addicted. Even in a medical setting, there's the, again, you just want to be careful. So if you have a substance use issue or history, ketamine can be helpful. Um, it can be helpful treating the underlying causes that led to whatever that that addictive behavior was. And, and, and actually, you know, I'm going to back up one more second. Actually, I say substance use, and I, and I immediately realize how wrong that is. It's not just substance use. That's that's where I, that's my go-to in my head when I think of addictive behavior. But it's any addictive behavior. It can be gambling. It can be work. It can be porn. It can be you pick your flavor of addictive behavior. E eating. So if you have an addictive personality, yeah, ketamine. Just you just need to be extra careful as you move through this process. Work closely with your doctor. If you use a guide or therapist, work closely with them. So it so to say they shouldn't do it. No, I wouldn't go there. But to say be extra careful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's some there's some contraindications. Obviously, if you're pregnant, again, the amount of I probably nobody's going to prescribe you ketamine if you're pregnant. And from what I understand from anesthesiologists, if you're if you're taking the type of dose that we're doing and you happen to be pregnant, you're it's probably okay. Um, if you have untreated or unmanaged high blood pressure, ketamine raises your your blood pressure. So that's something to be aware of. But if it's treated, for the most part, you can take ketamine. Um, yeah, I think that's how I would answer that question. And then, and then you get into uh, you get into some of what Fatima was talking about. If you're bipolar and you're in a manic stage, that could be a challenge. Um, probably not ideal. If you have if you have active suicidal ideation, ketamine is actually fantastic. It's one of the few things that can knock you out of being suicidal, but not doing telehealth. Need to get into a clinic and and see somebody. It's a different level of a uh, of a uh, of treatment. So again, it's, it's so I'm not. I don't think I'm drawing any walls that this person should not take ketamine. Period. I'm just saying be extra careful if you fall into a couple of different categories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Do you have any information on some of those people who have a spontaneous break or psychotic breaks? Um, do you have any information on if have has anyone tried it, you know tried ketamine after that experience? You know, usually so you're they saying get post psychotic break. Do you know if yeah, it's... yeah, like or even uh, schizophrenic um, symptoms and things like that? Have you heard any information around that? That falls exactly into what Fadiman was talking about. Of that, there's no researcher with a ten foot pole who is going to take somebody post psychotic break and give them a psychedelic medicine, even ketamine. Um, I believe like Reddit groups, you could find out information on this, but it, there's not, I don't, I, as far as I know, there is not a study I can point to that says, oh, look at these, these 18 people uh, who had a psychotic break, took ketamine and they were all fine. I don't, I don't think that exists, but uh, I'll keep my eye out for it. Yeah. Because currently I've been really interested in this uh, spontaneous break. I call them um, there is a group of research researchers in the UK. They 
they came together and they kind of shared their own experiences. Some of them were psychedelic induced or some of them just spontaneous. And um, one of the things that they did talk about was that these people, they don't talk about it and they kind of um, lost in the society. They, you know, it's very, unless it's in the family or it happened to your friend, you wouldn't even know about these things. Um, so we had an experience like that in our family. So um, I became very interested in what, you know, makes the person to, to break open. Uh, what are the, the causes um, underlying, you know, uh, issues and all of that. And um, yeah, it's a very mixed and very kind of complex subject. But yeah, I'm only going by the uh, information you shared with me about the suicide because they can be suicidal or at least they can be um, accidentally, you know, take themselves out because of the, uh, losing the, the, gr the grip of the reality. And I, so, yeah. I don't talk about this. I've actually never talked about this publicly. So, um, but I have a close family member who had a psychotic break and it was, um, that's part of also what drove me down this, uh, down this path. I mean, I went and visited, how do I, this? visit is actually the wrong word. The, uh, the conversations were getting to be so bizarre. I ended up hopping on an airplane and knocked on his door opened the door and he was covered with uh like fruit juice and or honey honey and I went into his uh apartment and all the electrical wires were cut his phone was in a uh, aluminum foil tent there was fruit in the bathtub he was anointing himself for the uh second coming um uh this is a jewish person and it was terrifying it was really really it was like wow and I had to uh worked have him involuntarily admitted and spent the night with him in a psych ward and just kind of watched everywhere I looked, there was dysfunction. Um, and then opportunities for, I mean, any entrepreneur listening to this, there are a million opportunities to make mental health care better. Um, yeah. A million. And, yeah. um, and then over the last few years, watching him kind of regroup back has been fascinating and it's, it's a slow process. Um, it's his comeback, but it's a slow process. Um, yeah. So I don't, I don't, I would be very cautious with psychedelics with somebody who's had that type of experience, period. Um, yeah, because you just, it's, yeah, you, I, I don't, there, I don't know. I don't know what the research says. And I've got to believe there are people out there who've come all the way back and have gotten such a mental fortitude that they are, they are able to process it, but that doesn't, I, I wouldn't, I, I don't think I would be comfortable doing that. What do you have other experience, Susan, on this? Uh, well, I did follow up on this and then there's a crazy wise movie. Yeah. yeah I love that. Uh, Beautiful movie. Yeah, exactly. And there is um, also, you know, the idea that the indigenous people would have these kind of people as leading the tribe or leading the community because they have deeper insights that really fascinated me. Um, but that's it really. There's no, that's all that I know. Um, I don't know anyone, especially from that research group that I talk about in London. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would love to talk to them actually individually. And I don't know if they carried on taking more psychedelic or it was a hard stop. But what they did talk about was that the connection, belonging, and a lot of grounding practices what what made them come back and um, start functioning again. Yeah, for those listening, that Crazy Wise film is really interesting because it explores a couple of things. It explores in our culture, our Western culture, that we don't have a place for people to return to who've had uh, any mental illness. We just look at them as broken and forever broken with really no use to society. And that's not how other cultures look at their their people. Um, and in many cases, they become celebrated, they become healers, they become shaman, they become other people. And it's, yeah, it's really quite a beautiful look and in a juxtaposition between someone having an experience in a Western side and someone having experience in some other, other sides. So um, yeah, it's, 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 it's worth looking at and just as another layer to think about as we're I mean, that's kind of the beauty of, of all of this, right? When you start down this path of psychedelic medicine, so many layers become, become worth talking about. It's like, oh, we don't have religious freedom in this country. Well, I thought we did. Or the, the, the press academia um, 
pharmaceutical connections are really tight and interesting, or even the press uh, 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 law enforcement connections um, to politics. And you just, it just keeps unraveling. So now here's, here's another, another unravel that ties into just mental health as a whole that becomes part of this process. So there's no shortage of things to think about when you dive into a psychedelic medicine. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. It just um, gets more interesting as the, you know, each day, um, especially in the mental health uh, space, especially mm-hmm. now the post pandemic, you know, there is a saying that we will probably see the real impact in the next few years and we are already seeing a lot more people challenged and struggling with mental health i think right now what you are providing and education and everything you bring is just really really amazing so i wanted to just thank you for taking that you know leading this space because um even though we don't have the solid you know platforms education we haven't really come to a solid understanding we're still exploring because of the halt because of the you know uh, 50s coming to uh, prohibition we stopped everything but now it's all picking up and I see a lot of brave people coming and taking the lead and really bringing so much uh, help and support to the world so thank you for all the work that you do as well Thank you. I mean, you you having these conversations and normalizing this is so important. I mean, that people can hear people like me all the time with you having conversations, talking about their trauma, their mental health, and not being embarrassed, just coming right out. This is what happened. This is how I feel about it. This is what I'm doing about it. Um, normalizes it. And we don't, for whatever reason, we treat a broken arm differently than a uh, than a, depre- a major depressive disorder or, or a depressive experience. Um, and it's, and it's, and it's sad and it's not fair. So I love that you bring these conversations up. You're doing it with a wide variety of people and allowing people to, uh, to listen, to think and to make, come to their own decisions. You're not, you're not saying this is the way it is, period. And you're offering a, a, a platform for conversation that is really, really important. Thank you so much for saying that. And thank you for your support as well. As we are coming to the end of our conversation, what would you like to say as a closing uh, words? And what would you say to our listeners if there's anything you'd like, you feel called to share? I think if you're still listening to this podcast 50 minutes in and you're not already using psychedelic medicine, I would challenge you to, to figure out why are you doing this? Why are you listening? What in your body is being activated? Is this for yourself or someone you love? Um, there's something going on and then what's holding you back from taking whatever that next step is you're considering. Um, if it's about safety issues, well, where can you find the research to make sure you're comfortable? If it's about picking the right first place, how can you get some reviews and some information to do that? Um, if it's about finding people like us to talk to reach out to people like us and ask your questions and see if we can help. But, um, if you've listened to this much, there's a reason. And um, and there are people like us who want to help you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Matt. Where can our listeners find you? We will have all your links and your information in the show notes. Sometimes we try and avoid some specific information just because um, we are, you know, we do get sometimes warnings and flags. So, um, but we will have all the information in the show notes. But um, if you wanted to share, where would you like? our listeners to find you mostly. Yeah, if you're stateside and you're looking for a ketamine telehealth provider, happy with two Ys dot me. Um, really, if you're looking for the information, my book is anywhere books are sold. There's an audio version of it now. So if you just want to listen um, and, and I read pieces of it, Dr. Carlos Warder reads pieces and then Leslie Howard reads all the pieces that are written by women. So it's a few voices that take you through it. Um, and then mattzeman.com, if you just want to connect with me, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Instagram. So uh, anywhere, I'm happy to, happy to connect with you. And that's wonderful. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your wisdom with us. Susan, thank you for having me. I really appreciate this conversation. You're welcome. I'm sure we'll have you back very soon for a follow-up, maybe just to follow your projects and have another conversation really soon, hopefully. I would love that. Great. 
Thank you everybody for joining us. Hope you enjoyed this conversation and I'll see you guys on the next one. Please say hello, share your experiences, ask questions, get in touch with me or Matt. Uh, don't be shy. We're here to support. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Psychedelic Conversations podcast is designed to educate, inform and expand awareness. For more information, please head over to psychedelicconversations.com. You can also share with your friends or leave a review so that we can reach more people. You can also join us in our private Facebook group to keep the conversation going. This show is for information purposes only and it is not intended to provide mental health or medical advice. Thanks for listening.